Welcome everybody. Another episode of Shared Humanity, part of the self-love revolution. So excited for today. Uh, we have Daniel Levin with us, the author of this amazing book, which I just finished, Mosaic. And the story, which I only know the surface of, but I cannot wait to learn more about, of, of leaving a billion dollar business on a search for inner peace and happiness via rabbinical school and, and monkdom. Um, but now we're gonna, we're gonna get the real stuff. Um, so first, thank you so much for being here. So I just lost two sentences because I was connecting my AirPods. <laughs> oh. We're gonna get the real stuff. I heard we're gonna get the real stuff from we're, the horse's mouth. We're gonna get the real story, not, not, not my, my little stuff. So, all right, well, let, let's jump in. So. First, I want to know, I, I want to know the journey from the, this billion dollar company into not quite rabbi to monk. So let's start off. Most people don't have an opportunity to run a billion dollar company. So no. how did this come about? Um, ill circumstances oftentimes open up huge doors. So as a kid, I lost my parents two years apart on the same day. And my mother's sister just happened to marry a man who was a household name. We were on the East Coast. They were in the Midwest. 50 years ago, the world was a bigger place than it is now, or seemed like it was bigger. We didn't have internet. We didn't have Skype. We didn't have Zoom. We didn't have any of these things. And so being 1,500, 2,000 miles away was really far away. So we didn't really know them at all. When my parents passed away, I thought I was going to move in with friends of mine because I didn't even know I had an aunt and uncle, really. Um, I sort of knew them, but not that much. And they determined because they had, it was my mother's sister and they had the financial wherewithal to easily take care of us. They were billionaires um, that we would move in with them, my brother and I. My brother lasted about two weeks and then he came back to the East Coast. I was a little, more, little bit more malleable. So my uncle looked at me and said, um, I don't have any sons. And in those days, you didn't hand over a billion dollar company to your daughters. Thank God the world has changed between then and now. But then it was not, the, it was not a changed world. And so he looked at me and he said, this might be a beautiful opportunity for both of us. I'm going to watch you for a month and a half. And I'm going to see if I see something in you that I can grow. A month and a half to the day, he took me out to lunch. And he said, I'm going to change your life today. I said, really, how's that going to happen? What are you going to do? And he said, I'm going to start you pushing a broom. And in 15 years, you will be in my seat. You will be, you will be running a billion dollar corporation. I want you to go as far as you can go and I will pick you up when you fall. I want you to go as far as you can go. I'll pick you up when you fall. I will mentor you along the way. There'll be no way you will not succeed in doing this. What do you think? Well, what would you think, Jonathan? I would say, let's try it. I mean, it, <laughs> I, I, with my new brain, I'm not sure, but certainly, yeah, I'm all in, let's go. I'll be in your seat not in 15 years is what I certainly would have said when I was younger. <laughs> 99% of the people would say what you said, maybe 99.999% of the people. I had just lost my parents. I was in a search to find something that, what, find them again, to find that place where they were. And so I looked at him and I said, you know, you're a, super, you're a wise man. Thank you so much for this offer. I can't tell you how much it means to me, but I have no idea who you are and I have no idea what this life really entails. I would like to stay here for a year and watch you and see if the life you're offering me is the life that I want. And I said, now, surely. How, how old were you at this time? 15. Got it. So I was old enough to know nothing. Right. I know. And, like, how did you have the courage to, to even do that at, at that point? Because it was my life. My parents passed away. I had no, like the beautiful thing about your parents passing away is you really don't have to answer 
There's nobody that you have to answer to. Had my parents been alive, I don't think I would have been able to do it because I would have always wanted to make them proud of me. I would always wanted to do what they wanted to do. I always wanted to respect and honor. These were people I didn't even know. They said they were my aunt and uncle, which they were. But I had no, like I had no commitment to making them happy. They were, they came, they brought me in to try and help me. They, and they did try and help me. They were incredible. But when someone tries to help you and offers you something that you don't want, it's not really helping you, is it? Right. And so I thought to myself, let's just see what this is. It certainly twinkles from the outside. It glitters really beautifully. I mean, my eyes were like, wow, what could I do? Like, look at all this money I could have. All my friends were suddenly the richest people in the world. And it just wasn't mine. It wasn't what I was looking for. And all my life, I've never been, my motivating factor has never been the one that motivates most people. My motivating factor has never been, how do I make enough money? How do I, ta- how do I be rich? How do I be well-known? My motivating factor was, especially when my parents passed away, how do I find that love again that I lost when my mom and dad passed away? I grew up in a great family. We were, we were, it was, you know, in those days, there was a show called Ozzy and Harriet and Leave it to Beaver. And, you know, all those things where it was just an ideal American family where the man went out to work. The woman was, went, worked a little bit, but was home making milk, milk and cookies for the kids. We grew up in a family of love. We had dinner every night together at the dining room table. My dad worked hard and had no money. He, he died with a mountain full of debt and one black suit. And my uncle had worked hard and had billions of dollars. And so the move from the East Coast to the Midwest was nothing compared from the move to lower middle class to elite upper class. And when I looked at it, I just saw things that I couldn't comprehend. Saw things that I didn't think were mine to do. Saw things that I never thought I would really have the opportunity to do what I needed to do. That I would always be, um, um, I would always be trying to be my uncle rather than trying to be me Mm. and there would never have been the room for me to try to be me because it was very like I I would ask him a question he said how many billion dollar companies have you ever tried started I said well that's easy zero he said then sit and learn how to do it and there's beauty in that there's real real knowledge in that but if it isn't yours it's not worth it so so you worked there for a year and then decided this is I, didn't even, I, I didn't work there for a year. I said, I said, I'm going to start. He said, I want you to start pushing a broom tomorrow. Most people would have said, when I said to him, I'm going to watch you for a year. He said, most people would have said, why, why wait a year? Why don't we start right now? Take me there. Give me the broom. I said, I'm going to wait a year. I just want to watch. I don't want to be involved in it at all. I just mm-hmm. want to watch. I just want to sit and watch and be together here with no expectations, no thoughts, no, and let's see what happens. And so, so what happened at some point you came to a decision. So, and obviously it wasn't to go there, but, but what was, what, what preceded the decision? And then what happened when you made the decision? So I watched and I saw, I remember I asked them three questions a year later. And the three questions were, do you remember your birthday party? I came running up to you and I said, it must feel amazing to have 400 people come to you and celebrate your birthday and love you that much that they come and respect your birthday and be with you. He said, Danny, none of these people would be here if I didn't have money. They don't love me. They love what, what I bring, what possibility I bring to them. And so I said to them with all due respect, why would you want to give me that present? Why would you want to give me the present of not knowing if I would have any friend that thinking that all my friends didn't care about me. They just cared about the money that I had. He said, okay, that's not a great way to start out the conversation. What's your second question? I said, suppose I was better than you in that regard, but I doubt I would be. You're a beautiful man. I remember sitting around the dining room table and the girls were starting to date. And do you remember what you said to them? And I, you said, and I said, tell me if I'm wrong. 
you said to them, you're attractive, you're smart, you're, but you're not that attractive, you're not that smart. The only reason a guy is interested in you is because of your last name. Be very careful. Don't fall in love with someone who's coming after your money. So I said, even if I were able to get past the first thing and I were able to determine these are friends of mine, these are people that want me for something and I could figure that out, why would you want to give that gift to my kids? Why would you want my kids to grow up thinking that they had no value except the value that people were trying to use them for their money? He said, okay, it's getting worse. What's your third question? I said, I love the fact that you're thinking to start me pushing a broom. That was, that's the best way in the whole world to do it. That would be the only way that I would do it. But as I push a room, I'm going to talk to every single person in every single department. And I'm going to ask them how they're doing and what they feel. And do they feel comforted? Do they have ideas that could make this company a better company? And if I come to you with ideas that I think would be from the people that work there, from the people that are given their heart and soul, that we might make this a better culture and a better company, would I have the freedom to do that? You remember you said to me, if it ain't broken, Danny, why fix it? He said, yes, I do. How many billion dollar companies have you started? I said, so do you think we have our answer now? Because even if I had, even if I was able to be, to find friends, even if I was able to raise my kids in a way that they knew they were loved for who they were, I'd have no authority to do anything, to make any changes. I would always just have to follow the model. That isn't someplace where I want to be. So I don't want to become the person you are. I don't want my kids to have the, the, the things that your kids have on them. And I don't have any room in that company to be me. So I don't think there's a place for me, do you? So like you said before, 99% of, the, of people would say, yes, sign me up. But you at 15 years old said no. What? How is that? What, what was different about you? Like, did you have these past lives that, that brought you to this place? Or what, what did you have at 15 that, that the rest of us um, don't know about? I don't know that I had anything that the rest of us don't know about. My priorities were different. I was looking for the unconditional love that my parents left me without. Yeah. I was looking to find that love again. I wasn't looking, I couldn't care less about the money. But the money, I saw the money. Not only did I see the money couldn't bring me that love, the money subtracted from my ability to feel that love. Wow. Because even in a place where I thought people would love me, my uncle was telling me they'd only love me for the money. So why in the hell, if I was looking for unconditional love, would I go into something that would steal every possibility of me finding that because it would put over it a template of people aren't interested in you for what you have or for who you are, they're interested in you for what you have. That's not unconditional love. That's very conditional love. And so it was not the heaven. I realized when I wrote the mosaic that when I asked the adults where my parents were, they told me they were in a place called heaven. And I set out in search of that place called heaven. For me, that place called heaven was a place where there was unconditional love. But the people I met along my journey were not the people that I thought I was going to meet. Hmm. They weren't the clergymen and the wise people and the, and the rabbis and the ministers and the shamans and the priests. They were common, ordinary people. They were the trash man and the road worker, the blind woman and, and the gardener, the juice man and the waitress. And I wondered, what in the world are these people going to teach me about heaven? How, why am I out meeting with them? And something inside me said, just Danny, take time, listen to their stories. You don't have anywhere you have to go. Just sit with them and listen to them. And when I listened to them tell me their stories, Jonathan, the person I initially saw wasn't at all the person that they were now. And that wasn't because they changed. That's because the way I see them, saw them changed. And when I realized that every single person I met was different than the person that I thought I saw. I started to wonder, is there anything in life that I see the way it is? Or do I see everything the way I am? And the moment I had that thought, I looked to my right and I saw a monk unzipping the sky and opening, up, opening me up to a parallel reality. It was there that I met the wise one. 
who is playing with mosaic pieces, arranging all the pieces of all our lives, all the pieces of me, all the pieces of the people I would come in contact with, all the situations, all the occurrences, all the, all, all the assortments of my life. He was just arranging them. And when I saw him, he gave me a shot on the, on the, on the forehead. And suddenly all those pieces became, I didn't know which piece I was anymore. I had an experience of this world, completely connected, completely one, nothing separate, past, present, future, all the same. I didn't know what body I was breathing from. I didn't know if I was a man or a woman. I didn't know what color skin, what country I was from, what, not, what language I spoke. And I sat there for, I don't know how long it lasted, but at a certain point I said, wow, this is amazing. And it was all gone. I ended up lying on a street corner next to a, a man in a downtown crowded place who was a street artist with pieces, broken pieces gathered all around him, putting together street mosaics on the, on the street. So is, is everybody in here real? Yes. Are these real people? Yes. Wow. Yeah. Do they know it's they're in there? I don't know. Probably not. Probably not. There were people that I met along my journey. They were, they, I took, it's a fictional book. It's not nonfiction. So I took some liberties with some of them, mm. but every single one of them, but you know what? It could be every single person that I meet today. All of a sudden I realized in, in this world that's happening for me right now today, if I were to write that book again, I would write about a mailman. Because Jonathan, between the time we first sat to have this interview and now, something happened to me. And I, I wish I could explain it to you. I, 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 I can't. But for some unfathomable reason, for some, for, for some gift that I was given, not because I earned it, not because I did anything to deserve it, not because it, I, I worked hard to get it. I don't even know how it came. But a beautiful gift was set into what is me, which is a cardboard box. And that gift was a gift of love. And that love is so tangible that I just carry it with me from place to place, from room to room. When I'm in clubhouse, I just take it with me and I set it on the floor. I'm bringing it right now to you in this room so that anybody who's listening to this can feel it. And when people say to me, well, how did you get that gift? And what did you do to deserve it? I can tell you this, my, my beautiful mind wants to come up with all the reasons of what I did and all the things that were possible and all the ways that I earned it and I achieved it, none of which are true. I did nothing. Somewhere along the line, I either had a dream and woke up with it or bumped into a stranger who put it in my pocket or I have. I saw something and I didn't even know I saw something. I turned around and suddenly I was in a different place. And people say, but that's not fair, Danny. You have to be able to tell people how to get it. You're on the show. Like they're going to want to know how, what did they do to have this thing that you've been given? And for the first few shows, it, it really frustrated me. But then I realized they don't need to do anything. It's here. I've just given it to you. It's not me. I'm a cardboard box in which the gift of love has been given. So I, I deliver the gift of love to this room in a cardboard box. We open the box. We throw away the cardboard box. We don't keep the cardboard box. What good is a cardboard box? We keep the gift. And I leave the gift here with you, Jonathan, and all the people that are listening. You don't need to now work hard to have it. It's like once you've cooked, once you've come to the banquet, you don't need to think about well, what should I do to prepare food? It's a table sitting in front of you. You just sit down and you enjoy it. This gift is being given just like it was given to me for no reason at all and for every reason. It isn't something that anybody in this room has done to deserve it or earn it. It wasn't something I did to deserve it or earn it for whatever reason. It's coming here now, just like it came to me then. 
So where did you get the gift? I know you, you went to rabbinical school. You, you it had nothing home. to do with any of that. Where, where, and it wasn't those. So I have no idea what I'm, get the gift? What, what I'm saying to you is I have no idea. It was suddenly, there one day. Suddenly, I have no idea. I turned around and I was a different person. I walked through the door from my bedroom to my living room and I, I, I was not the same guy. I don't know what happened. I literally have it. The only thing that I can think of in all the studies that I've done is a word called grace. That for no reason we're given a gift that we didn't earn, we didn't work for. We might think we worked hard to get it. I'm, I, can, I can tell you all, my brilliant mind wanted to go, well, this is because I did this, because I did this, because I did this. But when I ask the gift of love that I carry with me in this box, is that true what I'm saying? I said, so why did you come? They said, for no reason and for every reason. You don't have to work hard. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to tell people how to get it. Just give the box that you, just deliver this box to the places where you go. It's there for them. They don't have to worry about what to do. Just like you didn't. If it's, if it's so easy and it's right there for everybody, why don't more people receive the box, open the box, accept the box? I don't know. Maybe it's not. I, I, it, it was, it was always that easy for me too, but suddenly one day it was there. I don't know why. There'll be people that will listen to this show, and will think, "No, it can't be that easy. It's hard." They'll put it away. They'll forget that they even happened. There'll be some people that listen to this show and say, "Oh my God, I'm going to accept this gift," and just like me, for no reason they'll feel this infusion of love start to fill them up. I have no, I, I wish I could, every spiritual teaching that I've gone through does not speak this language. So I'm not saying for people to follow me, do anything. God, no, I'm a box. I'm a cardboard box. You don't follow a cardboard box. You open up the box, you throw it away. What I'm saying is enjoy this gift that I'm presenting on the floor to you. I've delivered it right to your house. I'm going to take my box and go in a few minutes. But the gift will remain with you. You get to choose what you want to do with it. You can pack it away, put it away. You can, you can, you can dive into it. You can play with it. You can make love to it. You can scream at it. You can try and understand it. You I can get try it and all rationalize right here. it. It's like right? you got around it. me right now. I feel yeah. it. Believe me, I yeah. feel it coming to the screen. It is all right here. Yeah, but how is that even possible? We lead these rooms in Clubhouse where people are all from multi-nations come into a room that doesn't even exist. And we take 20 seconds and send them love. We all say, let's fill our hearts with love. Let's send that love into this room. And let's, let's fill this room with that love. 20 seconds, go. And we do it. And now we say, let's take the final 10 seconds and feel that love coming back to us. 10 seconds, let's go. And then I ask people, if you felt that, like this is an experiment. If you felt it, click your microphone. The whole place lights up like a Christmas tree. How is it possible that people who don't know each other in a room that doesn't even exist can give each other love and feel it so tangibly that other people walk into the room a few moments later and say, whoa, what it is about this room? I feel so much love in this room and peace. How is that possible? That's not because of me, I'm a cardboard box. That's because love no longer is hiding. It's here. It's given to each of us. It's for all of us just to open our hearts and receive it. All the stories of all how hard we have to work to have it. All the things we think we have to do. Love doesn't care if we're good or bad. Love doesn't care how many people we've hurt or how many people we've helped. It doesn't care what color our skin, how much money we make, how, what we do for a living. It doesn't give a damn. Love doesn't know how to do anything but just simply love. That's mosaic. This, this infusion 
one piece to another piece to another piece to another piece. The delivery of a cardboard box filled with love. May we all be cardboard boxes filled with love, becoming mailmen that deliver this package everywhere we go so that the whole world feels it. It's time. It's more than time. But the fact that you can sit thousands of miles away from me and feel it, how is that possible? That can't be me. I can't do that. That's this beautiful gift. You've received it. That's the power of love. The power of love. It goes through space, time. All we need to do is pause and open the gift, as you say. When, when the wise one in the other dimension tapped me on the forehead, this was the experience I had. I was suddenly one with everything. I'm not one with everything now. I'm a cardboard box that carries that which is one with everything in it. Mm -hmm. And I bring that cardboard box so that people can experience it. I'm not gonna take it away. You, it's, I, nobody gives a gift and takes it away. I'll take, the, I'll take the mailing box with me so I can put more love in it and take it to the next place. You have the gift now. Anybody listening to this has that gift now. Enjoy it. Revel in it. Don't worry about what you have to do anymore. You've got it. Love doesn't care if you give it away. Love doesn't care if you, if you don't feel worthy. Love doesn't care if you feel like you're not good enough. Love doesn't give a darn what you think or feel or how you act or what you do. Love loves you. Simple. This isn't a hard philosophy to follow. This is the simplest thing in the world. Well, I just want to thank you. I know you have to run. Um, I want to thank you for sharing this, the gift, presenting me with the box, which I have opened and I feel. And I know, and I don't know how, but I know it's also available to everybody watching and listening. And I just want to thank you for, for being the box that, that shared this amazing gift with us. Um, uh, I'll, I'll have all the links for, for everyone. You can find the book, The Mosaic, um, as well as, as you'll see how to connect with Daniel. It'll be all in the, in the description. Uh, thank you so much for being here. It's my honor. Thank you so much for having me. And I can honestly say, brother, I love you deeply for no reason and for every reason. And Thank I you. love you as well, deeply, for no reason, for all the reasons. And everybody watching, listening, please remember, you are loved. We'll see yeah. you next time.